Wow, that, that was powerful, hey? I kind of feel like, do I even need to preach? There's just something about hearing a testimony, right? Of what God's doing in someone else's life. So, uh, interesting enough, this morning, sharing on uh, the power of testimony. We all just uh, close our eyes and pray. Lord, we thank you for the, the powerful testimonies of, of uh, the people we just heard. We thank you that it does something in our hearts. And I even pray right now that you would just continue to soften our hearts towards you and um, even help us, Lord, to just see your hand in our lives, um, to recognize your goodness your faithfulness. Yeah, be with us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're going to spend some time in Acts 3 and 4, just looking at uh, some testimonies and some of the interactions of uh, the disciples. Um, So um, yeah, I'd like you, uh, for those of you that have your Bibles, to turn uh, turn with me to to, uh, Acts chapter 3. For those of you that have your phones, unfortunately, uh, opening your app and scrolling to that doesn't have the same feel, you know, but uh, you're welcome to join there. Um, I'm going to spend some time reading there. Yeah, I just, uh, I can even still remember some of the testimonies of those that have been through uh, Freedom Sessions from last year. Very significant statements and things that I can still recount in my head. It's just something that happens when you can see someone's life being changed by the absolute goodness and faithfulness of a loving, kind Father. Amen. So yeah, let's read. I'm going to read from Acts 3, verses 1 to 12. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. The ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold. I can relate. But what I, what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him and praising God and recognized him as one of, one of the ones who sat at the beautiful gate the, at the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them to the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, addressed the people, said, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? It's a powerful scripture. It's a powerful interaction of, of someone, I think to a certain degree, some of us can relate. You know, whether you've walked past someone at, at the door of a, a store, someone that's asking for spare change, maybe you've passed a traffic light. You know, I come from a third world country where the traffic lights are filled with people that are desperate for just a coin, just to be able to, to buy some bread or at least eat something that day. And um, there's a few observations here which I'd like to touch on. You know that Peter and John were going to the house of prayer, going to the temple for prayer, which is amazing, you know? There's this thing, and Paul touched on it this morning, of going. 
You know, waking up in the morning, even coming to church. You know, they mentioned the ninth hour. Here it's the ninth and a half hour that you come to church. Things happen when you go. Things happen when you're with other believers. And there's a stirring. There's a leaning on. There's a partnering with. It is good to go to church. And prayer was important enough to make it a trip for them. These are guys that had walked with Jesus, serious about the kingdom, but they still got up and went to the temple for house of prayer. They didn't get up thinking they were going to encounter this guy at the gate. And what they encountered at the gate was a bit of an interruption. And uh, I can't help but think about Jesus through the Gospels. If you've read the Gospels, maybe you knew here and, and you don't know anything about the Bible I want to tell you you are so welcome here and we're thrilled that you're here. But in the Gospels, there's so many times where Jesus would be on his way somewhere, coming from somewhere, crowds around him, pushing him, demanding him that, he, that he goes here and he goes there. And on and on again, he was interrupted. Someone called out his name, please heal me, make me see, or Lord, forgive me. Or people brought in front of him and said, this is a sinner, what do you say? You know, they've broken all the law. What are you going to do? Now think about the, the one interaction where there was a ruler, rich run, young ruler that had a 12-year-old daughter that was dying. And they said, please, Jesus, won't you come and heal our daughter? So the whole crowd was on their way there. And there was pressure. You know, this girl is dying. And that's the moment where, where someone touches Jesus, him and his garment. And, and he turns and says, power has left me. And the lady with the issue of blood was healed on the spot. And um, the Bible doesn't tell us how long he stayed to minister to her, but he turned. And the, you can imagine the disciples saying, Jesus, like, there's no time for this. There's, there's someone dying. And Jesus is not interested. He's interested in the person in front of him, wanting to love, minister, and be there. And then, you know, some of the ruler's servants even came and said, you know what? Don't bother the teacher anymore. She's... She's passed away. And Jesus says, no, she's not. She's just sleeping. And he carries on. He heads out. And so there's this thing about what happens when you're interrupted. You know, you think about Lauren's interaction in the, in the foyer, wanting to, to tap out, you know. And uh, faithful Doug and the saints just pressing in and saying, no, we're going to do this thing. And... Uh, Something that, that, that was amazing for me is, is when Peter and John looked at him and he said, look at us. Look at us. You can imagine being someone that's down and out, poor, crippled, there's just no hope. And someone comes down and says, look at me. Look at me. Yeah, my heart, is, my heart is so tender this morning. I just feel like I feel the love of God here today. I feel like God's doing something here this morning. <sighs> Maybe you, yeah, and that's you. And no one has ever looked at you. <laughs> I feel like God is looking at you today. Maybe there's one of you. <sighs> this is not in my notes. <laughs> You know, this week, <laughs> on Thursday, I had to change a hockey stick and a broken toothbrush at Walmart. Okay, the hockey stick wasn't at Walmart, but I bought some electric toothbrushes for my kids and the one doesn't work, so I went to Walmart to change one. And uh, I was preparing, up to that point I was preparing, I was working on my preach. And I was just hitting a wall. 
So I thought, you know what, what can I do? And I looked up in the room and there was the hockey stick standing in the corner of the room. I said, you know what, got some time. Kids are out, Janina's out. Let me go and get some errands done, you know. So I climbed in the car and I just started praying in the car and I was just like, Lord, what do you want to say this weekend? And I was just so aware of God's presence in the car. I got to Walmart and uh, I don't know what it was, but I walked in and I was just, it was like Jesus' spirit had come into me and I could just see people. There was just people everywhere and I was just like, oh my gosh, what is happening? And the first person I encountered at the gate was one of the staff. Saw a name card, her name tag is probably this big, but it felt like it was, she was holding a poster <laughs> with the name Kim. And I was just like, oh my gosh. So I walk up to her and I said, hey, Kim, you are, no, I, was just, you, I was just lit up. And it was like no one has ever used her name. I didn't say anything. I didn't minister to her. I was just like, okay. So I, I just said, I'm going to swap something. So she pointed me to the table. And then the next guy that came saw his name, and I was just like, wow, I addressed him by his name again. Immediately from a, a downcast state, you know, eyes lifted up and looked at me. All of a sudden, I was just like, man, I was just so aware of God's presence, and that there was just hurting people all around me. And I, as well, she, this, this person said, they can't help me, they called someone else over, so I was standing, and I just turned around, and you got the checkout lines you know, right there, and, and I just looked up, and I just started seeing everybody, and I actually started to avoid eye contact, because I thought Jesus was going to do something. I was just like, what? <laughs> what is going on? And, uh, but every time, I just saw eyes, and I started to get a sense of what it might have felt like for Jesus to walk the streets. And that, for him, it wasn't about just teaching, or where he was going, but for him, it was absolutely missional. And there was trapped people, hurting people. And yes, people need finances. People need healing. People need support. But there's something deep inside of us that none of that can fill. None of that can stop and change. And that's what Jesus was about. He's standing before someone and saying, look at me. I see you, you are my child, you are not a mistake, you have been designed very specifically, you have been formed in my image, you have been placed on this earth for a, a purpose and a plan from start to end, and I love you, and I want you to be healed inside, I want you to be set free from your anger, from your pain, from your hurt, your abuse, from your depression, whatever you have, that's what Jesus is about. Some of y'all don't shop at Walmart. And I don't want to be judgmental, but you need to Remind yourself what the reason is. You know, maybe it's not for the product, but I tell you what, there's a lot of normal people there. Young and old, well-dressed, not so well-dressed. Saw quite a bit of pajamas as I usually do on my outings to Walmart. <laughs> people that are very put together and people that are not put together at all. Down and out from all walks of life. And then he said to the beggar, we don't offer gifts, we don't offer money, or even a promise of provision, but what was freely given to me and to us, we freely and excitedly, we offer to you. We thank you, Lord. He grabs his hand, he gets involved, and he says, stand, rise and walk. It's just an expectant faith and a stepping out, which I thought was quite significant. And then the man jumps up and he enters in the temple with him. <laughs> he ends up going to church, which is, uh, which is amazing. 
He went to church, many people came to church, and um, were just wondering about the miracle, you know. I also want to read from Acts 4, 1 to 4. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to about 5,000. They were added to the church. You know, there's, um, I think I'm just going to focus on three things this morning. Is that um, when it comes to testimonies, we all have a story to tell. We all have a story to tell. We all have something to share, the story of Jesus, the gospel, and then our story, what God has done in our lives, what God is doing in our lives. We all have something to share. And um, that's something that's really important for all of you to, to remember is that you are counted. Everything that you are, there's a purpose and a plan, and there's a reason that Jesus calls out to us and offers us salvation. Why he looks at us and he calls us in. The next thing I, I wanted to point out is that our story counts, your story counts. It's unique. And you are extremely uniquely positioned. In the family you brought up, were brought up in, where you live currently, the job you're in, what you've had to deal with leading up to this point, what you, what's to follow even after this day, where you go, where you drive. It's so unique that you have a story to tell and that your story counts. And the next thing is that God chooses us. The gospel and the kingdom are missional. There is power in testimony. We saw this morning, there is power in testimony. God chooses us. And um, when Andy last week spoke about the Great Commission and how all of his saints, all of us that know him are called to preach the gospel, to share, to be lights in the darkness. And I guess the question for us is, is always, when we're going out, what we're doing is, am I looking to bless? Am I thinking about the people that need to be set free? And this is what Jesus was about. You know, when it comes to testimonies, I was talk, talking to my daughter yesterday and I was asking like, you know, what is, what is a testimony? What does it mean to have a testimony? And, and she said, well, you know, it's, it's usually because, you know, you, someone that gets hopelessly lost, goes into drugs, ends up on the streets, finds Jesus, and then comes to church, and then they've got this big, massive story to tell. And I thought, well, that's, that's probably most of our opinions of, of what a testimony is. You know, I've, I've met people that have grown up in the church and never gone on a rage, rampant, like, you know, lost prodigal child and did everything wrong before they came to Christ. They grew up knowing the Spirit of God, parent, parents that led them in a way, and I've heard them say, like, well, you know, I don't really, I don't really have a testimony or I don't really have a story to tell. <laughs> and that is such a lie. <laughs> that is such a lie. You know, when it comes to us telling our stories and telling, telling our testimonies, it's not about our, our massive God moment. I mean, sure it is. And those are incredible tools and, and have got the ability to change lives. But it's really, it comes down to what is God currently doing 
What did he do last week? What is he doing today? What is he going to do tomorrow? Even what happened to me at Walmart on Thursday. I walked out of there shaking a bit and just thinking like, Lord, my prayer, Lord, is that I would become so gospel-focused and so missional that whatever I'm doing, I pray that you are doing, you are working testimonies in me because I am out looking for your hand. I'm out looking for the people that have not been looked at. I'm out looking and saying, Lord, what do you want to say to these people? Pausing before I go into the door, or just stepping to one side in the aisle and say, Lord, please, if there's someone here that you want to talk to, help me not miss them. Help me look at people's faces. I'm not just here for a toothbrush. <laughs> Maybe I am, but Lord, it's never just about a toothbrush. Maybe that's what I should have called this. <laughs> but it tests me, and if you're sitting there thinking like, well, what, is, what does it test me? What is something that God has done in my life in the last couple of weeks or in the last couple of years? Maybe you're at a place where you, you actually can't remember anything. You know, and maybe, it's, maybe you're in a place where you haven't pushed into God, but sometimes it's often because we, we're at a place where we're not seeing God. We're not looking for His hand. You know, I was thinking about um, asking somebody, you know, like share a testimony of your parents' love, your, your mom or your dad. Like what are some of those things? And you think, well, Actually, I asked my daughter this as well. And she said, well, she drives me to school and takes me to sports. She cooks for us. And I thought, okay, she wants us to eat healthy. I mean, it's a good mom, good parent. She cares that we shower and that we need to sleep. And I thought these are, these are very obvious, but they're quite surface level basic things. Like I think you could, some people could even get into trouble if you're not doing these things for your kids, you know, if you're not feeding them. <laughs> You're not bathing them. People call your son and say, hey, <laughs> I've noticed. But then there's profound things that are behind the scene that we get so used to our normal side that we don't see. You know? In most cases, as a child, you were planned. A husband and wife came together and they said, maybe it's time. You know, for some people, that longing to have a child has been for years, years. Children are wanted. Jesus loves kids, loves kids, you know. And as a, just a child in the house, you don't think about those things, you know. You were carried in a womb for nine months, carried. Your whole body have, has been committed to growing this child, sacrificing, changing shape, stresses, hormones, food, it, it is, I've been around it twice, it is a journey, and it wasn't even me doing it. At infant stages, your mom had to dig deep, night after night, to care for you, to make sure you were alive. In some cases, mom and dad had to weather really difficult storms to keep it together for you. There are daily sacrifices a mom or a dad make in denying a flesh day in, day out that is part of this love. Now, a child, unfortunately, as they grow up, they don't see these things. They just see the snack that they didn't get or why they can't play with this toy or go outside or not come inside. But that doesn't mean that there's things that aren't there. And I feel like for us, often, God is doing something. God is always moving, he's protecting, he's answering prayers that sometimes you've forgotten that you prayed about. You know, I was talking to, to my kids yesterday, or two days ago, of, of one of the things that they would pray for every day in the car on the way to school. Not me, not Janine. They would pray so much so that they would repeat this prayer. I, I actually thought to myself, oh, you probably don't have to pray for that every day. And you know what? Part of that prayer has been answered. It looked pretty impossible, and there's still a lot of work to be done there, but part of it, a big step has been answered. And I just said to them, like, that's, 
That's a testimony. That's God doing something and, and things, you know, you think about, again, Lauren's story about the doctor. We all know what it's like to get a family doctor, yeah. So yeah, God chooses to use us and all of us have testimonies. Things are happening. And I want to encourage you guys to, to dig in. Something we've got to do is to learn to look for God's hand and blessing in all situations. We've got to be prepared to share the reason or give an account for our faith and salvation. Some of you guys know the scripture, 1 Peter 3 verse 15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everybody who asks to give you the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. I get it. Some of you guys are introverts, and the thought of sharing the gospel is just so overwhelming. And I think often we build it up into this thing where I I need to know the gospels and the scripture back to to front. And, And there is a responsibility for us to get to know the word. But... Sharing a testimony or, or, or being able to witness to somebody is not necessarily about just sharing the whole gospel. You know, if you, you can come to Christ this morning and experience the love of God and you can go out there and you can share that already with the world. I remember getting saved and not knowing everything that was happening to me. And I had not gotten to the point that I even started reading the Bible yet. But I remember something had changed inside of me, and friends at school had started to, to notice. And they, the, I remember one guy, his name is Richard. He, he pulled me aside and he said, Hey, Lee, why are you so happy these days? And that was the first time I can remember sharing a testimony of what God is doing in my life. I didn't know scripture, I didn't even understand the gospel, but I knew that I, I invited Jesus into my life as Lord and Savior. And I just said to him, hey, this is what's happened. Like, I was one way, and I met Jesus, and I feel like he's changing me, and he's changed my heart, and I'm becoming a, a new person. And I was eventually able to, to, to take that guy to, to church, and he made a commitment to follow Christ. And that was the first experience I had of, of being involved and in seeing someone not knowing Jesus and coming to a church, someone else preaching the gospel, but him standing up and putting his hand up and going to the front. And that's, yeah. And that's, you know, the word says, we know the scripture, it says that we overcome by the power of the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And for us sharing that and being a witness and why our testimony is so powerful is because it's something that God is doing in your life. Last two points here is that we need to speak of his goodness and of all the things he has done. Our Father in heaven is a good God, full of love, full of mercy, full of compassion. In Psalm 34, 1 to to 3, it says, I will exhort exhort the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord." Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name. Speak of his goodness and let his praise always be on your lips. And then the last thing, and I've touched on it already, is am I looking to bless people and thinking of people that are trapped, those that are, that are there to be set free? And uh, I just got this picture well, not this picture. I drove up towards Lanceville the other day. There's a farm. Just, just as you're kind of exiting Lanceville or heading up to that new Timmy's and Shell Garage, there's a farm on the right that's got the fiberglass plastic horse. And every now and then you see the horses like moved around to the other side of the property, you know. And it's like stationary horse. It's just this dead horse, you know. But the farm just before that, they've got a couple of cows. They've got a couple of horses. And the one day I was driving there, and, and every time I go around that bend, you can see all on the, the fields there, I saw this horse that obviously had just come out of the stables, and he was just galloping across this field. His hair was like, you know how the hair does? It was like a full-on movie scene. 
And he even did that, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, when a horse does that little funny hop thing, and it's just like this, you could just see like this, there was this freedom, and he'd been like set free. I don't know how long he was in the stables for. But I just thought, oh my gosh, like I remember the time where I met Jesus, and something that I've always described as in my bedroom when he came, when I called out to him, it felt like my whole life I'd been living in a, in a closet, like in a cupboard. And Jesus just unlocked that door. And I, I felt like there was things that just left me and there was just this freedom and God had saved me. And that was, that was my experience in that moment. And I just thought, again, I've got to say this, and that the gospel and our walk with God in the kingdom is missional. It is about others being saved. It's about what God's using us to do. Am I looking to bless people, thinking of those that are trapped, that need to be set free? I was going to get the band up, but I'm not going to do that. We have a responsibility as a church. Maybe you, know, you don't know Jesus this morning, and something's been happening in your heart right through this morning, through the testimonies, through whatever happened earlier on on the stage with me and the softness of what God was just doing there. And you just, you're confused, but you know something's happening in your heart. Like the Holy Spirit is here. And I trust that God is revealing his goodness to you and answering some questions you've had maybe your whole life. And if that's you, we are, we are overjoyed that you're here. Maybe you've been a Christian for a couple of weeks and you're still trying to figure out what this means. This is a great place. And I want to I wanna tell you right from the beginning that what God has done in you and is doing in you is for millions of people out that door. And you have joined an army of saints that are missional, that are called by God, by Jesus himself, as his disciples to go out there to share the gospel, to share our testimony, to speak on what God is doing, and to, for his praise to be on our lips. Maybe you've been here in church or in, in a church community or Christian your whole life, and it's been years and years, and you have, you have forgotten that Jesus is always about the next person to, to, to look at, reach out to, to heal, set free. Then I'm here this morning to remind you that you are part of an army of believers that are called by Jesus himself to go out there to share testimony, to share his word, to share what God's doing in your life, what God's doing in this church, in your, your friend's life, in someone in your family. There's always something to share. God is always doing something. So I'm gonna take this time now and I'm gonna pray for us. Maybe we can all stand I'm just going to read this in Acts chapter 4, verse 29. This is where the believers pray for boldness. From 29, and now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal heal. And sign and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they, were, when they had prayed, you are now, Lord, we look up to you. And our hearts are three. God, grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. The last part of that is, says, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. We all close our eyes. Lord, we just want to thank you for your goodness this morning. We want to thank you for testimonies. 
We want to thank you for being able to hear the life that you're breathing into people's lives. Holy Spirit, we, we thank you that you're in this place doing a work in us. And we want to pray together, Lord. We want to stand together as a church before you with open arms and an open heart and say, Lord, we are your church. We are your children. We are your soldiers that you have called. We pray this morning for a boldness. And it's not a boldness that goes out and kicks down a door. Maybe there's a time for that. But the boldness is believing that you are good, that you are full of love, that you want to save, set free, heal, and deliver those that are oppressed, those that are lost. And you choose, Lord, you choose to use us. And we want to be available for you. Often, Lord, we ask for power. We ask to see you in our lives. And maybe we just never go out. and We just stay in our houses. We never step any. We don't, we don't step out. And I, I want to pray this morning that as a church, we stand before you, Lord God, that you would give us that boldness, Lord. In whatever environment we're in, whatever our personalities are, Lord God, that you would provide those opportunities, but that you would give us heart for the, for the lost, a heart for the oppressed, the, a heart for the needy, and that we could look at people, we could, we could walk out and say, look at me, silver and gold have I not, but what we have been freely given, we give to you. I pray that you help us see your hand and recognize your goodness in our lives. And Lord, if, we, if we're not feeling you work in and through things yesterday, today, and tomorrow, then help us to recognize where we're not pushing into you, where we're not seeing your hand, where we're not pausing and giving time to you. I pray that over every soul here this morning, Lord, We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.